Hello, everyone. Welcome to this EU Cross webinar. I'm Alexandra Nemoylan from the Leuven Centre for Global Governance Studies at KU Leuven, and I will be moderating this webinar on China and the Global Commons with Dr. Mathieu Bournet from Queen Mary University of London and Dr. Sven Grimm from Stellenbosch University. Mathieu is Senior Lecturer in Global Law at Queen Mary University. He's also Visiting Professor at Beijing Normal University, as well as Associate Fellow at the Leuven Centre for Global Governance Studies at the University of Leuven. He holds a PhD in Law from the University of Leuven and a double MSc degree in International Affairs from Peking University and the London School of Economics. His main research interests are in global law and governance, the study of political and legal as aspects of EU-China relations in global governance, as well as the comparative study of the rule of law in Europe and Asia. Among his most recent works, there is Chinese perspectives on the international rule of law, law and politics in the one-party state. And in 2018, he was also awarded a Jambonet Network on EU-China legal and judicial cooperation entitled EU Plant. So thank you very much, Mathieu, for joining us today. Uh, many thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Many thanks, dear Alex, for your very kind introduction. I mean, good afternoon, everyone, wherever Let you are. Let me, uh, you... sorry, if I, if I could just briefly introduce also our discussant. Oh, my apologies, um, yeah. Dr. Sven Grimm, who is a political scientist who has worked on external partners cooperation with Africa since 1999, and he's head of the research program on inter and transnational cooperation at Stellenbosch University. The emerging economies role in Africa and specifically China-Africa relations feature in his work since 2006. Uh, Dr. Grimm has studied in Hamburg, uh, Accra, Dakar, and has obtained his PhD from Hamburg University uh, in 2002. His research interests include the comparative perspective on external partners in Africa, Chinese development cooperation with Africa, European Africa policy, African perspectives on development, and discussions around cooperation between Europe, China, and African states. So many thanks indeed to Sven as well for joining us today. Thanks very much. Just as a minor correction, the uh, inter- and transnational cooperation I deal with the, at the German Development Institute, as I have the two affiliations. I just oh, right. Yes. Apologies. 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 Um, just a couple of words on the EU Cross uh, Germanet network, of which both Mathieu and Sven are members. Uh, it's uh, a Germanet network funded by um, the European Union, which investigates the challenges and opportunities that the European Union and its main international partners face in times when our conventional understanding of the global order is put into question and multilateralism is contested. Finally, as for the general structure of this webinar, first Mathieu will present for approximately 25 minutes. This will be followed by Sven's comments. Um, during both presentations, you may send to me your questions via the webinar chat box, and I will then feed your thoughts and comments into the discussion uh, with both Mathieu and Sven. It's now my pleasure to give the floor uh, to Mathieu, and I very much look forward to his presentation. Mathieu, you have the floor. Uh, many thanks, Mr. Chair. Many thanks, Alex, for the very kind introduction, and also to Sven to kindly agree to uh, be the discussion this afternoon. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar, which will focus on China and the global commons. The perspective, the purpose of this presentation is to analyze, I mean, how and why China does influence, I mean, the making of regulatory frameworks governing the commons. And the big question which I would like to try to answer today is the extent to which China's increasing engagement with the global commons shall be seen as a form of contestation of existing global governance structures or whether, whether it should be seen as a contribution thereto. In that context, the big question that we will try to answer relates to the extent to which China should be seen either as a, Rome as a norm taker or whether as a norm maker or norm shaker in the global governance of the commons. 
in order to answer this big question, my presentation will be divided into three parts. In the first part, I just would like to highlight, I mean, two factors which explain why I think that debates on the global commons have become so prominent these days. I mean, these two factors relate, first of all, to the fact that we have seen the emergence of a multiplicity of stakeholders now becoming increasingly active in the governance of the global commons. And secondly, the second factor, which I think is quite important, does relate to the fact that we have seen the emergence, the establishment of a number of new institutions, norms and procedures to govern, to govern the global commons, global commons which had remained to a very large extent under-regulated in comparison with other areas of global governance. In a second part, I would like to situate, I mean, what I would define as China's growing engagement with the global governance of the commons in the broader context of recent changes in uh, China's foreign policy. And in the last part, I would like to focus more particularly on what I would characterize as being the specific features of China's engagement with the global commons, China's engagement with the global commons, which I would define as entailing a so-called instrumental and selective approach towards international law, an engagement with the governance of the global commons, which also entails attempts to localize the governance of the commons, and I will here focus more particularly on cyber governance, and last but not least, this idea of a difficult engagement with transnational actors, with non-state actors in the broader governance of uh, the global commons. So this is a little bit the menu for, let's say, the coming 20 minutes uh, of this presentation on China and the global commons. So let's get started with the first part. And here, let's maybe start with a definition. I mean, to make it clear what I mean with the global commons in the specific context of uh, this webinar. In the context of this webinar, I mean, global commons will mean, I mean, those natural and importantly also those virtual assets which are situated outside national jurisdiction. And the argument which I would like to put forward here today, I mean, in front of you is that indeed we've seen, I mean, an increasing debate on the governance of uh, the commons, a debate which has become more prominent today than it has ever been uh, in the past. I would like to specify here that by governance of the commons, it will be primarily meant here in the context of this webinar, the regulation of behavior in the commons, rather than the assignment of property rights or the, redis the redistribution of resources, which could be, let's say, the second way to look at uh, the global commons. The first, I think, factor which explains why debates on the global commons have become so prominent today does relate to what you could call, I mean, the emerging or the increasing multi-stakeholderism when the governance of the commons is concerned. It is very clear that multipolarity now characterizes the governance of the commons with a higher number of states who now want to guarantee their access to the commons. The nature of globalism is obviously very different in the 21st century than it was in the 19th century, where European empires had very much a kind of monopoly over the governance of the commons. In the second part of the 20th century, I mean, in the mid of the Cold War, we could obviously rather talk about a leadership which was assumed by both the Soviet Union and the United States. And now it is clear that, I mean, against this background of a growing multipolarity, that we do see quite a number of new actors, quite a number of uh, emerging powers who have become quite important in the governance of the commons. Just to take an example here, I mean, if you take the area of space governance, it is very clear that a number of emerging countries, ranging from China, India, but also Brazil, have become increasingly, I mean, active in space exploration. Let's not also underestimate, I mean, the increasing role which is played by a number of equatorial states, which thanks to their geographical location, their geographic situation have also become significant actors in the governance of the commons. 
obviously, if you if we want to understand also the way comments are governed, it is very very important as well to go beyond. I mean, a state centric approach when the governance of the comments is concerned. Indeed, a number of transnational actors, being among many others, I mean, civil society organizations, but obviously private corporations have also become increasingly central in the governance of the commons. Just again, to say a few words on the specific area of space governance, it is very clear that non-state actors and private corporations have now become increasingly central in the emergence of space tourism. We are also talking about private corporations disposing of the necessary research and development capacity to facilitate the transition to a greener economy or also private corporations occupying a premier role in internet governance. Internet governance, which now constitutes in a certain way the emblem of transnational private governance. Now, the big question obviously against this background is the extent to which this emerging or increasing multipolarity on the one side or on the other side i mean the emergence or the increasing importance of transnational actors and more particularly private corporations how does it affect i mean the overall governance of the commons to what extent does it contribute more particularly posit positively i mean to the overall uh, governance of the commons and more particularly i mean there is the overall question of the extent to which, I mean, the, the emergence of those, of those transnational actors is not actually shaping, I mean, a system which had been for long based on or governed by a nation state sovereignty and by the territorially defined uh, nation states. So multi-stakeholderism, I think, is the first factor which we really need to bear in mind. The second factor, which is, I think, also quite important, does relate to what I would call, on the one side, the under-regulation of global commons, so the fact that, indeed, in sharp contrast with a number of other areas of governance, I mean, global commons had remained for many years largely unregulated. And what we have seen, indeed, in the last few years is the fact that, I mean, we've seen the emergence of new regulatory regimes governing the commons. It is, for instance, particularly clear if you look at the regulatory frameworks, I mean, governing, I mean, the fight against climate change. And the question there is obviously the extent to which now those new emerging powers, but also those transnational actors, how do they actually contribute to the increased legalization of the governance of the global commons? And what we have seen, and that's also an important point which I would like to make here, is that in this process leading towards an increasing legalization of the governance of the commons, we have also seen the emergence of new innovative forms of global governance and international lawmaking, which is also something which is quite important to bear in mind if we want to understand China's increasing octaness in the governance of the global commons. Now, let's start talking a little bit about China. And I think that if we want to understand the way China engages increasingly with the governance of the commons, it is, first of all, very important to recognize that there have been significant changes in China's foreign policy in the last few years, and more particularly since Xi Jinping came into power. I mean, the main illustration of this significant shift in China's foreign policy obviously relates to the emergence of this important narrative, which is the one of the Belt and Road Initiative. Belt and Road Initiative, which is the illustration of the fact that now China is trying to enhance its, its so-called discourse power, to use this kind of Foucault type of language, which means that language means power, and that indeed, if you are able to shape the language, if you are able to shape the concepts, the norms, the institutions which are actually used and being talked about in global governance, that it actually means that you've been able to enhance uh, your power. To put it in a different way, it is very clear that the main mantra, that the main foreign policy doctrine, which did characterize China's foreign policy under Deng Xiaoping, under uh, Jiang Zemin, and later on under Hu Jintao, namely this idea of keeping a low profile foreign policy, this idea of observing kindly, this idea of holding one's ground, this idea of responding soberly and getting something done, 
is very clearly a minor doctrine which has been largely abandoned. And the least that we can say is that indeed this has had a significant impact in the area of the governance of the commons. A kind of additional point which I would like to mention here is that if you want to understand, I mean, China's growing role in the governance of the commons, it is kind of interesting to bear in mind, I mean, the digital aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative. It is indeed at the occasion of the 2017 Belt and Road Initiative Summit that Xi Jinping made it clear that he wanted, next to the Belt and Road Initiative, to build up a so-called digital Silk Road of the 21st century. Digital Silk Road of the 21st century, which will have a significant impact on a number of uh, global commons from outer space. I mean, with the establishment or, or let's say, I mean, the perpetuation and deepening of China's global satellite navigation system program, but also the construction of a number of hard infrastructures in the digital economy, including fiber optic cables, which will now be used as part of this emerging global telecom empire, whose, I mean, kind of mapping you can see here on the map. And among those many projects of constructions of fiber optic cables, I just would like here, I mean, to point out to one particular project which has been quite controversial, which is the construction of these fiber optic cables connecting the Pakistani city of Gwadar in Pakistan with Djibouti on the one side and uh, Mombasa on uh, the other side. So just to say that indeed this whole narrative on the Belt and Road Initiative this whole narrative on the digital Silk Road is also important to bear in mind if we want to understand China's role in the governance of the global commons. The last point which I would like to make in that regard if indeed, is indeed that if we want to understand China's growing activism in the, in the governance of the commons from the perspective of recent changes in China's foreign policy, it is also important to bear in mind the fact that as early as 2014, as early as the 2014 plenum of the Chinese Communist Party, China made it clear that it was now ready, I mean, to play a more active role in global governance, no longer by acting primarily as a norm taker, but by becoming rather a more active rule shaper and rule maker. And now the, the idea of the following slides and uh, of the following minutes will be to highlight, I mean, how these ideas of becoming increasingly a norm maker or a norm shaper as translated into a kind of increasing activism in the governance of a number of global commons. And I just would like here to start by uh, climate change governance and climate change law, where it is very clear that China has become increasingly active. So as you all know, I mean, China was not an Annex I country to the Kyoto Protocol, which did, not mean, which did not mean that China did not do anything in the meantime, I mean, to fight again against climate change and enhance, I mean, environmental protection. I mean, a number of domestic laws, a number of domestic sources of legislation have been adopted in China. And I would like to point out here more particularly towards the 2014 environment protection law. The key turning point, if you want to uh, uh, pinpoint to uh, um, the main turning point when China decided to make a stronger commitment towards the United Nations fri uh, framework to fight against climate change, it is important to go back to the uh, UNFCC, I mean, conference which took place in Copenhagen back in 2009, in the sense that it is at the occasion of this conference that China, I mean, submitted and did put forward its first emission limitation targets, which meant that China was ready to reduce its emissions by 40 to 45 percent by 2020 compared to 2005 levels. China became then, I mean, an active supporter of the Paris Agreement, I mean, a support towards the, part, the Paris Agreement and more particularly its system of NDCs, the so-called nationally determined contributions, as by the way, also being repeated at the occasion of the state visit, which President Macron, President Macron, the French president made to China, I mean, a few weeks ago, in which both leaders did reaffirm, I mean, their joint commitment towards the Paris Agreement, 
I mean, another point which is kind of interesting to, to, to identify here is that it is also in the context of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, and more particularly in view of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, that China has also launched its own emission trading system a few years ago. So this is just to take the example of climate change governance. Let me now, I mean, refer to another, <coughs> sorry, let me now refer to another global common, which is the Arctic and the very specific theme of Arctic governance and law. I mean, China, I mean, the least that we can say is that the Arctic has now become an increasingly important player uh, in, the in the global game. I mean, we've also witnessed generally, I mean, when the governance of the Arctic is concerned, I mean, a considerable amount of cooperation, which has been taking place in the region, also leading to a situation where international law has now become central in the governance of uh, the regions. When China is concerned, I mean, China, I mean, did join and did, I mean, uh, was recognized an observer status in the Arctic Council back in 2013. And it is very important in that regard, I mean, to recognize the numerous interests which China has in the region, which range from uh, maritime circulation with the important uh, Northern Sea Route, as well as obviously also access to energy resources as well as uh, where Earth. Quite importantly, I mean, if you want to understand China's growing activism or growing attempts to shape the language used in Arctic governance, China's attempts to, pro to propose new norms or to shape the discourse on Arctic governance, it is important here to have regards to uh, China's first white paper focusing on the Arctic, which was published back in 2008. Uh, 2018, sorry, and quite importantly, and I will come back to that in a moment, a white paper which emphasizes quite strongly the importance of multilateralism and also international law. But I will come back to that in a moment, because I think it is quite important now to, uh, to emphasize what I would characterize as being the three main features of China's engagement with the governance of the global commons. The first characteristic which I would like to highlight here is what I would describe as being a partial and selective commitment to international law and also towards the international rule of law. And here more particularly, I think it, it's quite interesting to see that the very wording of China's white paper uh, on the Arctic, on Arctic governance, which was released back in 2018, which indeed was trying to, sh to find a, the right balance between the legitimate rights of coastal states and also the so-called common interest of the international community in the governance of the Arctic, relying upon to a very large extent in that context to the international law of the sea, to the unclosed, I mean, making strong references to the need to ensure, I mean, the freedom of or the, the, the freedom or rights of science and research, and research, the need to ensure, I mean, freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight, freedom of fishing, and so on and so forth. I mean, those very strong references to the unclosed obviously do start in sharp contrast with the way, I mean, China has refused to engage with its own obligations with regard to the United Nations Convention on the, on the Law of the Sea, more particularly in the context of the South China Sea arbitral proceedings in which China indeed refused, I mean, to recognize the legitimacy of the arbitral proceedings established by virtue of Annex 7 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, saying that the arbitral tribunal was considered as, legitim as illegitimate and at the end of the day when the ruling was made declaring, I mean, the ruling null and void. So in a certain way here, we really see in that particular context a kind of selective abidance, a kind of selective compliance or commitment towards the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which does testify to this partial and selective commitment to the international law and the international rule of law. The second point, the second main feature, I think, which is quite important to bear in mind is also when the governance of the commons is concerned from the Chinese perspective, this idea of a very reluctant engagement 
with transnational actors and more particularly with civil society organizations. It is very clear that under Xi Jinping, I mean, we can literally talk about a shrinking space for civil society organizations to operate. I mean, I would like to mention here a, a, an intra-party document which became well known as uh, the so-called Document 9, which was released by the Chinese Communist Party back in 2013, and which made it clear that civil society, from the perspective of the CCP, was nothing else than a political tool, I quote, in the hand of Western anti-China forces. So this is a little bit the kind of mood in which more particularly, I mean, foreign NGOs have to operate uh, in China these days. That being said, I mean, I just would like to uh, refer here to an, uh, to an interesting article which was included in China's uh, civil procedure law, which was recently um, reformed, recently revised, which allows, I mean, relevant organization, I quote, as prescribed by law, to, big, uh, to bring, sorry, a public interest action in cases of environmental protection. So when, I mean, the environment is concerned, when the fight against climate change is concerned, we indeed see that this idea of public interest action is now emerging in China. Now, obviously, it's kind of interesting to know what those so-called relevant organizations do stand for. And you have here to relate back to the so-called 2014 environmental protection law, which defines those so-called relevant organizations as those organizations that are registered at the civil affairs departments of people's governments and have specialized in environmental protection for five consecutive years. I mean, in practice, what does that mean? I mean, most of, I mean, all uh, so-called gongos, the governmental, non-governmental organizations do qualify as so-called relevant organizations. A number of independent NGOs active in China also do qualify as relevant organizations, but it is very clear that non-Chinese uh, non NGOs, foreign NGOs, do qualify as uh, um, relevant organizations, which would be in a position indeed to bring public interest action aiming to protect, to enhance environment, environmental protection uh, in China. The last feature, the last characteristic, which I would like to identify here before moving uh, to my conclusion in a minute, does relate to what I would call the Chinese territorial temptation when the governance of the commons is concerned. I mean, it is very clear that when we talk about all those global commons, we are talking about we are, we are literally talking about areas of governance which are by definition transnational. And quite interestingly, China, and obviously China is by no way any kind of exception here, has hardly resisted the temptation to try to localize the governance of the commons. You obviously have a variety of ways to localize the governance of the commons. One of them is, for instance, to try to regulate the commons by adopting national laws. This is, for instance, something which China is now doing increasingly in the area of space law, in the area of space governance. Another, I mean, quite interesting development in that regard does relate to the introduction in the 2016 cybersecurity law of this concept of cyber sovereignty, of cyberspace sovereignty. I mean, a concept which, uh, to be honest, still needs to be articulated Theoretically, I mean, it still remains quite difficult to know and to understand, I mean, what is meant by cyberspace sovereignty, but it is very clear that we are also, I mean, that we should relate this concept to the idea of localizing the governance of the Internet, I mean, uh, upholding the Great Firewall, which also means and which obviously also implies, I mean, keeping blocking certain websites and upholding the system of heavy censorship which characterizes uh, still today the Chinese internet. In practice, I mean, this cyberspace sovereignty has also been translated into uh, data localization rules with the cybersecurity law of 2016, which foresees that all personal information and information data, which is collected or generated by critical information infrastructure inf operators in China, 
must be stored in China. This is Article 37 of the 2016 cybersecurity law. And obviously here, you also have significant transnational implications. Just imagine, for instance, I mean, the need of EU companies being active in both China and the European Union, who would need then to comply not only with the GDPR on the EU side, but also would also need to comply with the 2016 cybersecurity law. So these are, let's say, the three characteristics, the three features which I wanted to highlight here. First of all, a partial and selective commitment to international law and the international rule of law. Second, a reluctant engagement with transnational actors. And last but not least, this territorial temptation, which leads towards a localization or attempts to localize the governance of the commons. And this leads me actually uh, to my uh, conclusion, conclusion which will be very simple. I mean, the first point is that I strongly believe that the governance of the global commons appears and emerges increasingly as an important arena, either to confirm or also to contest existing global governance structures. This is something which is particularly possible in view of this character, characteristic characterization of the governance of the commons, which I made at the beginning of my talk, namely that global commons remain still very much under-regulated and that we have witnessed an increasing legalization of the governance of the commons. This is the first point of this uh, conclusion. And secondly, I mean, it is very clear that global commons also offer China the opportunity not only to take, obviously, I mean, um, those norms which had been established for quite a number of years, but also, I mean, global commons offering China the opportunity to shape and make norms depending on its national interests. I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very much looking forward to Sven's comments first and then to your questions. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, Mathieu. Thank you so much for this, uh, I would say, compelling analysis of how China has evolved as a global actor, in particular in relation to the global commons. And indeed now, uh, it's time for the comments from Sven. The floor is yours. And then we will have a quick reply from Mathieu. I would just remind our attendees that uh, we are waiting for your questions for the Q&A session that we will have at the end of this webinar. Go ahead, Sven. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Uh, it's particularly interesting as a paper for me and as a discourse, because it's uh, an interdisciplinary dialogue that we're having here. Much here coming from legal studies, and I'm more of a political scientist, which might shake some, shape some of my um, comments as well. And, and I hope that's a fruitful engagement and a fruitful exchange that we're having here. Um, I like the paper very much. I enjoyed reading it immensely. And I, I'll try to go through the, the, the structure. Also, your presentation very much reflects the paper. So I'm, I'm not telling anything that uh, our um, attendees do not uh, know about. You describe the uh, global, you define the global commons as assets outside national jurisdiction. That sounds like a very clear um, definition, and you do give the Arctic space, climate, ocean, cyberspace as as areas. Yeah. Um, I'm. I do have questions on whether that means they're outside jurisdiction or they sometimes are contested in jurisdiction. The ocean is one of the uh, elements. How far does it go? Which area is actually national territory and which is not? That's one of the major challenges for China, South China Sea, and then mm -hmm. the Arctic being a territory that you don't claim as a Chinese actor, but you engage in. But there's also other areas where I would see possibilities for global commons, questions whether they are global commons, um, freshwater, transboundary freshwater resources. Um, what happens with the resources that you claim in your territory waters? Fish is not necessarily stationary. They do walk, they do move around. Is that, can you regulate that? Is that national or is that a, a global common? 
Um, migratory species, air pollution. You do have a nice reference in the paper, um, Justinian, on um, things that are common to mankind being the commons. And he mentions air specifically. Pollution is one of the elements there. And much more contested, and probably legally much more um, contested, would be the question on forests as major assets that keep the, the planet um, alive. And we did have a discussion with Brazil on that matter, whether that is actually a national asset or whether that's a global common, and we have to engage there. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a bit more questions on, on my side on, on what are the, the global commons. Mm -hmm. Uh, in that, I think I would like to, I would have wanted to see, I would have expected to see, um, and that's because it's different literature, from political economy, Eleanor Ostrom, governing the commons. Mm. She, she talks about governing the commons, not the global commons, which is a major difference. The question is, can we learn something from her discussion on governing the commons, also on governing the global commons? Are there elements that need to be there? So just as in terms of the the phrasing of the, um, the the framing of the of the discussion, I think that would have been interesting, or it would be interesting to engage on that. For for the questions on outside jurisdiction elements, there again, uh, legal studies, in my understanding, always address human behavior, interrelations between humans, and resource use related to other humans in the here and now. How much space is there in, in legislation for planetary concerns, non-human interests, uh, which ultimately are human interests because it's our ecosystem that we're talking about, and how much is there space for transgenerational, cross-generational issues, long-term sustainability as an, as an element uh, that can probably be included, but how much is it? That leads to debates uh, on the to the to the section on the debates on the commons. You mentioned the multipolarity, transnationalism, the legislation and the alternative discourse. And I think I'm I'm more moving towards the alternative discourses here that that uh, that were raised. In positioning the discussion on the global commons, I would also hope to have a bit more context on the global public goods discussion. Mm. You do have global commons and global public goods. Both are part of global governance. Um, are there differences? How are they sitting together? You mentioned that in passing, and that's a very interesting point. I would like to hear more uh, about that. And mind you, about, can you repeat the last point you've made here? The the global public goods yes. as a point, which is different from global commons, or it might be different in terms of how actors behave. Um, it is mentioned, as I say in, in, the, in the paper, in terms of uh, security and passing or the trade regime, for instance, would be a global public good. Um, how, does, how does China behave in that? And mind you, when I give comments to the paper, there's a long wish list that I have because I found the paper interesting. I thought there are more elements that could be raised. You probably can't raise them all, all of them in the paper. Um, moving on to the Chinese behavior of governing the commons, that I think was actually, well, sorry, no, it's the uh, China as a, as a stakeholder. I think it was well presented and it, it's very interesting points that you raise in terms of changes of the discourses, changes of foreign policy, a very different behavior of China globally, both on the global commons, but also I would say on global public goods and other elements under Xi Jinping much more proactive, much more trying to shape a discourse, trying to create an own narrative, as you rightly point out, and becoming a, a rule maker. Now the question is, which rules? And are these rules, and that's relating to your, to your last point and in your conclusion, are these rules relating to national interest? And in political science, you would immediately unpack, okay, what does you mean by national interest? Who's involved in it and who's defining the national interest? This is a combination of, of different interests there. Is it a longer term? Is it an um, enlightened interest? How does that sit? How does the national interest, the discussion on the, 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 the common good in China, 
how does that sit with the global common good? Is it contradictory? Where are limitations and how do you can how can you bring those together? And I think that relates to the discussion on the use or recurrence to law. I would say, and that's probably a political scientist in me, that's never free of interest. And then which interest is that? Why do you refer to the why do you recur to the law and what is in the what do you enshrine in the law? Um, maybe some points and just two or three smaller points on the stakeholder. You, you mentioned the emphasis on multilateralism, rhetorical emphasis in some instances, but also, but also in some instances, actual reference uh, to multilateralism. Um, space, you did give some indications where China was proactively trying to provide some rules, maybe for their own interest, but that was actually trying to give legal um, emphasis. The Arctic being an element where the freedom of uh, shipping, uh, the freedom of the use of waters is a very clear interest to China, but it does contribute to multilateralism. Climate governance was an element that you also raised. What you have a little bit more in the paper and have presented a little bit less on is the changing discourses on human rights and development and I think that's an interesting part to see how discourses are changing and how the the new core the, the newfound proactiveness in foreign policy is actually used and how to balance that in, in an overall assessment um, and I think for the the um, the Arctic and the South China Sea are good examples of selective, uh, selective application of legislation. That was very clear, and you, you really pointed that out in the paper, which I liked a lot. Uh, it might have to do with my initial point on differences of perspective. How far does legislation go? Mm -hmm. I don't think that, uh, to my knowledge, China challenges the, um, uh, the third party litigation. But the very starting point is, there is no challenge because this is our territorial water. The others are claiming the water, but it's actually ours. And others see it very differently. Uh, and, and that is the basic uh, discussion, I think. Now, for the, the last point that I would like to make, you say the localization of governance of the common, as well, the, the temptation of uh, national legislation. Um, that is a very interesting point. And I think particularly with regard to, to cyberspace, there's a lot that can be argued here. I think it needs to be done very carefully and crafted very carefully because we also in Western countries have the discussion, well, West in, in European countries have a discussion of uh, freedom of speech versus hate speech. Where do we draw the line? I do not want to draw the parallel to the Chinese legislation, but I think we have to be very careful in pointing that out of national legislation that also affects cyberspace in our setting and where the differences are. You did, you did mention the G, GDPR, the European General Data Protection Regulation. It's of a different nature, I would say, to Chinese regulation. It will have to be argued a little bit more because otherwise the argument can be very quickly shot down by China and say, you do that yourself. Um, this is not unique to us. It's also your policy. And I think in that we have to be a bit more more careful and, and a bit more giving more details on our own legislation and why they are different. So sort of a mm -hmm. bit more comparative element that needs to be in there. And last but not least, um, what I also enjoy that's more in the paper than your presentation was the discussion on the on the concepts of the commons and some references to Chinese uh, philosophy and thinking on it, all under heaven and public interest of the community or the state being in there. To me, that very much raises and the question and enlarges the discussion away from the global commons, including the global public good, as I said, mm -hmm. but also then taking deliberation in it. How do you get to the agreement that this is something that is actually affecting everybody? Deliberative process. And then, as I said, as a third element, the, the generational, uh, as, a, as a third element, yes, the generational dimension that I would see in there. So we have mm -hmm. limits. We can agree on lots of things and we do not want to hurt the other person, but there are limits to the planet that we can 
cannot uh, exceed and we would have to take that into account. And then we would very quickly be in a discussion on what is the global common good and how does China contribute to it and where does China see the global common good, uh, which elements does it see and which element does it not see. And I think the paper is a wonderful, wonderful um, contribution also in that context. Uh, and that's how I read it and, uh, as I said, enjoyed it a lot. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Mathieu, I think you can go ahead with a um, perhaps rather brief, but uh, well, concise, let's put it that way. Um, concise. Uh, it will be the many, uh, yeah, I, I, I understand the many points raised by, by, by Spano has done an excellent job as, as discussant. Um, and then we will we will move to uh, a brief Q and A session. We have some flexibility as for the time frame, uh, so go ahead, Mathieu, and we'll we'll see how how it goes. Thanks. I mean, first of all, I mean, many, many thanks, Vent, for those very meaningful and uh, uh, um, very meaningful comments, which I will definitely bring on board. I mean, uh, so this presentation was indeed based upon the paper, which is still very much a working progress, and I had to be a little bit selective in the elements that I could present here in the context of the webinar. So I won't have, obviously, time to respond to each and, en each and every uh, individual points which were made here by the discussant. But with regards to um, the definition, uh, the definition is meant to be open-ended and I think that the different additional potential comments which you've listed I mean in the discussion of my presentation and the paper I mean are all I think comments which would nicely fit also in terms of I mean trying to analyze the way China tries to shape or make I mean uh, or transform the governance of those various comments a difficulty which I have, and I think this is a difficulty which I already face now with the comments which I have selected in the context of the paper, is to try to take into account the differences in terms of nature between those different comments. Because obviously we are talking about comments of a very different nature when we talk about cyberspace, when we talk about the Arctic, the high seas, the outer space, and so on and so forth. So I think in that regard, I mean, this idea of being a little bit selective in the comments which I used was a little bit instrumental and to facilitate my work. So I, I recognize the kind of methodological flaw, I mean, uh, in, in, uh, in that regard. Um, to, to, to kind of, I mean, what is an important point which I would like to make here, an important point which I would like to make here is that the common nature or the transnational nature of those global commons actually should not be characterized or should not be, I mean, uh, implied from the nature of the regulations to govern them. I mean, whether we talk about the Arctic, whether we talk about cyberspace, whether we talk about the high seas, I mean, we do see, I mean, a system of multi-level governance at play, that's more, let's say, for the political arguments, but also, I mean, a multiplicity of legal instruments which actually come at play. I mean, we've been talking here uh, in the discussion of this paper quite a lot about international law, national law, but let's not also forget, I mean, the private standards. I mean, private standards which have become increasingly important and which have add, added up in a certain way an additional layer to, um, to these different transnational legal framework, transnational legal frameworks, which sometimes compete, sometimes complement each other, and make in a certain way, I mean, the, uh, the and, and, and in a certain way shape the very nature and the very format of the governance of uh, those different comments, which we are talking about here uh, in the context of this paper. Uh, the distinction with global public goods, uh, I think this is indeed something which needs to be um, to be uh, further, I mean, better articulated uh, in the paper. Uh, I, I would say that the paper deals primarily about access, access to the governance of the commons and the different ways to indeed access the governance of the commons. And I make it clear at a certain point that I'm not dealing with the fair distribution of resources, fair distribution of resources which would be, I think, 
I mean, the main feature, I mean, if you would indeed want to understand, I mean, the way global public goods are governed versus the global commons. So that could, that could potentially, I think, be part, part of the answer, uh, part of the answer here. Uh, with regards to um, the uh, uh, China and the, the substance of the norms which are actually promoted by China against this background of a growing activism in global governance, my answer to that is that if we want to understand indeed the substance of the norms which are promoted by China internally, that it is very important not only to have regards to the ways in which law is increasingly instrumentalized internally, I'm talking here about the evolutions of the domestic legal system, which has been characterized as a turn against the law when China's domestic legal system is concerned. That's uh, on, the, on, on the one hand. And uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the other hand, obviously also a focus on the law, which is very much informed by what has been described, I mean, a revival of authoritarianism in China. Uh, that's a book by, uh, just to quote Karl Minzner, who published this book on uh, authoritarian revival and the end of an era to kind of characterize, I mean, changes in China's uh, domestic governance under Xi Jinping. And it is very clear in that regard that if we look at uh, the norms which are promoted by China internationally, that there is no substantive understanding of global justice to be found. So if indeed we want to talk about the international rule of law, it is very clear that China does not promote any kind of substantive or thick understanding of the international rule of law, which would be made or which would have at its heart, I mean, a certain understanding of certain rights, of certain norms that you could define as being the rule of law, human rights and democracy. Um, a last point which I would like to make here and which relates, I think, to the last point which you made on this idea of, I mean, localization or attempts, I mean, territorial temptation in the governance of the commons. What is quite interesting here is to highlight, I think, what I would describe as a tension between localization and globalization. I mean, it is quite interesting if you look at the governance of cyberspace that China is now organizes every year an internet, an internet, I mean, a global forum, I mean, which takes place, I mean, in China on an annual basis. So on the one side, indeed, you have this pretension of China or this idea of China being an actor who is really, I mean, active in the global debates, I mean, relating to cyberspace. And on the other side, I mean, you have indeed this concept of cyber sovereignty, which could easily be described or understood as an easy way for China to justify, I mean, its significant censorship regime, which characterizes inter internet governance within China. So in a certain way, there is a risk, I mean, to try to play, I mean, both games, to be fully encoded in the dynamics of globalizations in the global debates, pertaining to the, uh, to the governance of the commons. And on the other side, I mean, trying to localize the governance of the commons through the different means uh, and instruments, which I have tried to describe here. So I'm fully aware that I have only answered or even not answered uh, uh, more than 10% of your comments. But again, many, many thanks for this valuable input, Sven. Thank you very much, Mathieu. And I, I think it's a good time to move to our Q&A and perhaps you can go back to some of these uh, points now in the uh, Q&A discussion. Um, so we have a question from Giovannina Sutherland Condorelli, who uh, asks you to, to elaborate a bit on uh, the role of China in the Antarctic and uh, whether how, the degree to which China is open to multilateral approaches in that context beyond the Arctic uh, Treaty. Um, we then have a question from Matthias van Hullenbusch, um, who asks, as you can contextualize China's conf conflictual normative conduct, is such selectivity with international law necessarily problematic for the purpose of governing under -regulated, the under-regulated realm of the global commons? If so, why? Uh, Matthias is contacting us from Shanghai. Um, 
And uh, we then have a further question from Christoph Beischel, um, who instead uh, wonders whether there are clear fronts, clear positions among states regarding the preferred uh, legal governance of different commons. And if so, who seems to support the Chinese approach or, or follow a similar direction? Uh, do you see an option to find the global approach to the legal governance of the commons? He points out that when it comes to outer space, many scholars uh, hold that due to multilateralism, it's unlikely that there will be an additional legally binding uh, international uh, treaty. And finally, um, from Priya Pujari, um, is China the next uh, superpower? <laughs> uh, given this trajectory that you've outlined when it comes to the shift of Chinese foreign policy, uh, is that what we should what we should expect? Go ahead. Many many thanks for uh, all these extremely relevant question uh, questions. Sorry. Um, let me maybe get started uh, with, I mean, Matthias' question. Uh, so the second question, um, which, I mean, uh, related to the question of whether, I mean, um, having, I mean, an instrumental or selective approach uh, or case-by-case -case approach was actually something problematic. Let's be uh, very honest in that regard. I mean, China has an incoherent foreign policy. The United States has, I mean, an incoherent foreign policy. The only international actor which is actually bound by law to act as a coherent actor is the European Union. And we see the kind of difficulties that it can, I mean, uh, that it can, can, in which it can actually translate when the European Union's global actorness is concerned with difficulties to enhance and uphold I mean, the vertical coherence in the EU external action, that is the coherence between what the EU does on the one side and what the EU member states do on the other side, or also the horizontal coherence, that is the ex EU's external action in different fields of uh, European foreign policies, comparing the actions of a variety of uh, EU uh, institutions. So let's say that per se it's, it's 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 definitely from the perspective of a big power such as china i mean the fact that it is not i mean coherent is clearly something which is not problematic and i guess that i mean indeed this kind of contradiction which i put forward between the way china has been dealing with unclose i mean in the context of the south china sea dispute I mean, actually, and here I want to go back, by the way, to Sven's comments. Indeed, there was this idea that there was no dispute, or at least that if there was a dispute, that this should not be resolved, I mean, before an international tribunal, but rather, I mean, in line with the ASEAN code of conduct, I mean, based on bilateral discussions. So in a certain way, even if, I mean, there was no recognition of, I mean, the existence of that dispute, there was still an openness of China not only to discuss these things bilaterally, and another point which I make in the paper and which I didn't make in my presentation, I mean, relates to an argument which was put forward by my colleague from Maastricht University, uh, Wim Muller, who described, I mean, China's engagement with the South China Sea dispute as a kind of non-participatory participation. By non-participatory participation, he actually meant the fact that while China did not officially participate to the arbitral proceedings, China nevertheless tried to put forward complex, I mean, uh, legal arguments to support its own claims, I mean, claims which have not been, I mean, arguments which have not been taken into account in the context of the arbitral proceedings, but which still demonstrate the fact that in a certain way, China engaged with the proceedings through this so-called system of non-participatory uh, participation. Um, is an, uh, I'll move to the next question, that, to the last question that was, uh, is China um, the next uh, superpower? Uh, the way I would like, I mean, to answer this question is the following. 
that is that indeed if we describe China as being an international actor, I mean increasingly contesting, I mean the global governance architecture as it stands, a global governance architecture which you can describe or which you can criticize uh, for its lack of institutional legitimacy, for its lack of normative legitimacy, for shortcomings in terms of effectiveness, Indeed, we can recognize the fact that China does contest increasingly, I mean, this global governance architecture. But the point which I would like to make here is that this contestation does not come only from the outside. I mean, the contestation does not only come from the outside of this so-called post-World War II liberal international order. But if you do characterize or if you try to understand, I mean, some recent moves which have been made in the U.S. Um, uh, foreign policy, if you consider, I mean, changes taking place or in or governance reforms being made in a number of EU member states, from Poland to Hungary to uh, Romania, I mean, you do actually come up to realize that the contestation is not actually only coming from a set of authoritarian states, being China, Russia, and a set and a, a handful set of other authoritarian states, but indeed that the contestation also comes very much from the inside and for me this is really i mean what is the most worrying in the context of this so-called crisis of the post-world war ii liberal international order the fact that this contestation does not only come from the outside but also com comes from the inside and in that context i think that it remains to be seen indeed what will emerge out of this contestation i think that the message of this presentation i mean it's quite clear in that regard that is that i mean we are very likely to witness an increasing i mean multipolarity i mean in the governance of the commons but also in the context of global governance and uh, a, a multipolarity in which traditional actors or more particularly actors such as the european union will need to find a way and will need to find a new way i believe um the question on the role played by China in the Antarctic, I mean, maybe that uh, Sven will have something to add on that because I know that, I mean, you published a paper on the Arctic, but maybe that you also said a number of things on the Antarctic. I mean, the points which I can mention here is the fact that to my knowledge, I mean, China has been way more active in terms more particularly of scientific research in the Antarctic than it has actually been uh, in the Arctic in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, more formal or institutional involvement, it seems that at least China has been more active in the context of Arctic governance, making indeed those extensive uh, references to UNCLOS being uh, uh, an observer in the Arctic Council and so on and so forth. So I don't know, Sven, if you want to add anything to that, or I don't have that much info, to be honest, on the Antarctic. So. Uh, Sorry, I'm switching. Sorry, I had to switch my microphone back on. Sure. That's why I took it. <laughs> um, I don't have much to add there. I think it's very much a question of science input. I haven't seen yeah. much on the on the uh, Arctic Council, which also has a very strong element of scientific um, publications that they do have, and I haven't seen much uh, on that side. I'm not an expert on the area. It's more. I'm more interested in the transnational uh, element in there and having people having actors from outside the area also engaged and China clearly is an actor from outside in the Arctic. Uh, I would subscribe to what you have said on the on the Antarctic and on the Arctic, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. And, and, and last but not least, I mean, the question um, by Christoph, uh, namely, if I understood it correctly, what is uh, the future of multilateralism? What is the future of uh, international uh, legal instruments when the governance of uh, the commons is concerned. And here again, I think it's very important to make a very sharp distinction between uh, the different commons. I mean, we've seen that, for instance, in, uh, in global environmental governance in the fight against climate change, that with the Paris Agreement, we've seen indeed the emergence of innovative, I mean, uh, a governance uh, regulatory and non-regulatory mechanisms which tend to demonstrate the fact that indeed, I mean, uh, regulatory and non-regulatory mechanisms still have a kind of future. I mean, when the governance of uh, climate and uh, the and environment is actually concerned, 
in a number of other areas, I mean, things are obviously way more complex. I think that space governance and space law, I mean, is particularly obvious in that regard. I mean, most multilateral treaties governing outer space were adopted back in the 1960s, where obviously, I mean, space exploration was in a very different stage from where we stand now. I mean, with a number of actors taking the lead, uh, the United States, the Soviet Union, and so on and so forth. Now we have, I mean, this growing multipolarity. We also have, I mean, the increasing importance of transnational actors. I mean, if you think of space tourism, for instance, I mean, what will be the right way, I mean, to regulate uh, space tourism? I mean, in that regard, it is quite interesting to note that China has been developing an increasingly comprehensive set of regulatory instruments governing I mean, space tourism, I mean, China is kind of taking the lead, uh, taking the lead in that field. So it's quite interesting. I mean, um, it is likely that we will not see any kind of multilateral uh, treaty governing outer space materialize or being adopted uh, in the near future. What we see now is that the key uh, space powers are now trying to based, I mean, their decisions on interpretations of existing treaties to their own benefits. So there is this idea of securing, I mean, their own uh, national interests through so-called innovative interpretations of existing, I mean, treaties governing outer space. And as uh, uh, mentioned in my slides, but I didn't have time to mention here, the latest attempts, I mean, uh, to uh, propose, I mean, um, new, I mean, legislation in the field by Russia and China, more particularly, I'm referring here to draft treaty, draft treaties proposed back in 2008 and back in 2014 on the prevention of the placements of weapons in outer space and of the threat or use of force against outer space objects. I mean, there has been no, I mean, consensus on the um, on the opportunity, or more particularly on the substance of uh, this joint proposal coming from China and Russia. I mean, the main critiques obviously came from the United States and did relate, <coughs> sorry, to the absence of uh, verification mechanisms, and also to the fact that there were no restrictions foreseen by the treaty on the development and stockpiling of anti-satellite weapons which would be put on the ground and not in outer space. So, so as we can see here in the, in the domain of uh, space governance, the situation is obviously way more complex than it is in other, uh, for the governance of other global commons such as uh, climate, environment and so on and so forth. Mathieu, thank you very much for your exhaustive, uh, extensive uh, replies. Uh, Sven, is there anything else you would like to add? I just would like to flag the, the private sector. Mathieu has mentioned it, and I think it is something that it needs to be taken into account. It's obviously extremely relevant when it comes to cyberspace, but also in other areas, um, both in shaping norms, um, but also in questions of even once you have norms, how you police them and who's policing them, uh, and the mm. question of principal agent discussions that we also see in the Chinese context. We very often tend to forget that in see China as a monolithic actor, um, there are principal agent problems to quite an extent also in the Chinese context. Uh, probably not so much on the global commons, more on global public goods, but that needs to be looked into and as a very bold statement I'm making now as a, as a last, last comment here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven. And uh, I think uh, that is all the time that we have for today. I would like to thank our speakers, uh, Dr. Mathieu Bourdonnet and Dr. Sven Grimm, as well as, of course, our audience members for taking part in this EU Cross. Uh, webinar. To keep up to date with the activities of the EU Cross Network, you can check out our website and follow us on Twitter at EU Cross. We'll soon share updates on the upcoming webinars. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you will join us again next time. From Sven, uh, Mathieu, and myself, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.